cool. How they got hacked? Episode six. Oh yeah, episode six already. Six already. It's because he's tired. He's been popping boxes for the last week. Oh my god! Preparing yes. for some exams. Yeah, yes. the OSCP for all you guys who uh, who are familiar is it's not an easy exam. Not an easy exam. So lots of work. Busy. Lots of studying. Yeah. Lots, lots of, of late nights. Falling asleep at the keyboard. Waking up to a lot of uh, un. Unintentional keystrokes. <laughs> Lots of code execution. There's piles of empty Red Bulls around them. Yeah. But it's worth it. It's worth it's it. It's pretty intense. It's uh, worth it. That's, that's the important part is, in the end, it's worth it. I've been learning a lot. Yeah. So, uh, Tom Lawrence. Xavier D. Johnson. Maurice Nash. All right. So, now you know who we are, in case you are just starting at this episode, in which you, you shouldn't. Go, go roll back five episodes. <laughs> yeah. Go give us a couple spins. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple things we're going to talk about today. So, we have... Um, the Wi-Fi jamming, the WP3, and some mobile app hack. But the big thing we're going to talk about at the end today, we didn't. We heard you about the honeypots, and we're going to actually set that up as not this video, but as a demo of a honeypot. Yes. Uh, he's just been busy and hasn't had time to do it. And uh, But we're going to set one up. That's going to be like a separate video. But we, we're listening. We read all the comments, like we said each time. We got um, you. We we're going to do, we're going to cover like the setting up of the honeypot, putting out a honeypot out there, what you collect with a honeypot, and then we'll talk about that. But that's going to be like a separate, we'll just dedicate a honeypot video mm -hmm. to that so this is just your how they get hacked we're gonna talk about a couple news topics but dive into the matrix well we're going into the matrix. are we following the white rabbit we're following the white rabbit <laughs> yes. because the matrix got hacked and Oof. so um there's we'll, a glitch in the matrix a glitch in the matrix and we'll cover that in depth uh, after we start with these couple of our news topics because you know back when i was in high school if you wanted to get out of an exam you would, uh, well, allegedly, maybe someone sort of maybe a, pulled a fire alarm. There's a couple ways you can allegedly get out of a yeah. test back in the day. You could pull a fire alarm. Yeah. You could call maybe. Maybe. You could call in a certain situation. Oh, oh no, we're no, not no, going to no, name. No, we're, no, that's no, why we're no, not no, going to name like jail it. time. Maybe you should never call in a situation. <laughs> never. Uh, never. That's a bad idea. No, no, no. <laughs> but, you know, these days, kids are, you know, more technologically advanced. So And they're Wi-Fi jamming. So Wi-Fi jam. wi jamming. Yeah, a couple kids, a couple kids in Jersey. Uh, the according to North Jersey, North Jersey .com, Dennis Miller said school officials had uh, had reached out to the police department, notify them the students were part of a scheme oh. where they would disrupt the school's Wi-Fi upon demand. Wi-Fi. Of course, this is where it goes bad. First, they figure out they can disrupt the Wi-Fi. Then it becomes a scheme because they're offering it as a service. Would you like your Wi-Fi disrupted during exam time? Got that exam you forgot to study for? We'll press the button for you. Twenty nine ninety five, whatever they were charging, I have no idea. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So um, I've actually there's a video if you look on my channel called Wi Fi de authing. I they they appear to be doing it a little bit different, but they weren't overly. It didn't get as technical maybe as I want because it sounds like they were doing jamming yeah. uh, versus de-authing, which mm -hmm. are very – jamming is an FCC problem, which is going to get these guys in more trouble. Yes. De-authing is an attack – but it's a different law you're breaking yep. because you're manipulating an electronic device as opposed to broadcasting a signal to disrupt other signals. They exactly. should just use a deauthor. That's they my should. debrief to these guys' yeah. advice. Deauth next time. Yeah. <laughs> look, look up deauth and ESP on Google, and you'll find that the chip is like five bucks to be able to yeah. pull this off. Or you can uh, go to Tom's channel. I have the GitHub, and I walk you through how to do it. That's one of the reasons I have the Wi-Fi device that he's seen in my thing. It's, I have a go. video on this. There you go. <laughs> Not so, that I'm authorized. You should do it, but it's, you should understand how these attacks work right. on your network. Uh, yeah. Because if there was a smart network admin watching this, this is how it went. There was obviously some type of admins. They caught them. Uh, I didn't... They caught them the way all young boys get caught. <laughs> How's what? that, Mo? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to impress a girl. Oh, boy. Oh, eh. yeah. And oh, boy. she told on them. There you go. Oh, that's yeah. really impressive. We, we can, we can, girl, I'm so cool. I can take the school down. Mm. I can shut down the box. She's like, ooh, can you, can you do it during my test so I won't have to take it? Sure, baby. <laughs> and he did it, and now they're in trouble. Oh, boy. Yeah. So. Facing some FCC, uh, FCC. Big, big stuff. Yeah, but salute. FCC won't let me be. Salute to the young hackers. I always like when you know they start early. It just shows you know a techno less prowess, ingenuity, ingenuity. Oh boy. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I can condone this, guys. Uh, if you just do any amount of googling, you'll see that this is how we get botnets. Yeah. Like, this is <laughs> this is why we can't have nice things. So do you guys remember Mariah? Uh -huh. Remember the Mariah Botnet? Yeah. Do you guys know the motivation behind the Mariah bo Botnet? Yeah, that was one of the games, the uh, Minecraft servers. No, 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 no. No, the Mariah Botnet was the one uh, in New Jersey, actually, at Rutgers, 
And um, if I'm not mistaken, this kid got caught and, he, and everything went down. And he was, uh, he was basically collecting all of these routers and all of these IP cameras to do DDoS attacks on the college when they were booking classes. Oh, okay. Ooh. So he could get the classes. S so that so that people couldn't register for classes. Wow. That's that was like just don't do stuff at school. Like go. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not condoning else. the act. I'm just <laughs> condoning their. Uh, I'm trying to think of the word. Their ingenuity. Uh, ingenuity. It's interesting. Their... Um, we just gotta. Mold these uh, young kids and to get them to do something like in the right direction, the right direction, mm -hmm. and things like that. So that's definitely there. Ethical yeah. hackers. Yeah, Ethical I mean, uh, I think that Wi-Fi jamming is a. I think it's low hanging fruit. Uh, it, I think the problem is is that these kids got their hands on the equipment to do jamming versus do yeah. I think yeah. that yeah. this would be a completely different topic from my perspective if this was a do versus a jam. Jamming could could be potentially. Uh, dangerous not only because of you know the the lack of communication on that particular band but because of the overspill and the the yeah. bands next to yeah, right? yeah. and it yeah. is an FCC problem to do this because for a while there there was a few people and they realized it was legal uh, I can't remember the exact article but what people what people were aggravated in New York about uh, people who are on their cell phones in the yeah, subway I remember that. yeah so someone just came up with hey I can just press a button and create interference but mm -hmm. the problem you're created is what if someone had an emergency and wanted to call nine one one or do something like that mm -hmm. well now you've now blocked all cell phones I mean yeah I got that person being loud they oh yeah 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 you know in, in, and it's annoying sitting next to a subway with someone's mm -hmm. having a conversation real loud like that. But you've also stopped an emergency. And that's where this comes into an FCC problem because you're actually blocking potential emergency access. Now, being interesting is if these kids come back and go, you know what? We thought about that and we accounted for it and we're using this oh. amount of power <laughs> and we only could get this amount of wattage and we could only get this amount of feet. <laughs> yeah. Right, that'd be interesting. Oh, no, we, were, we were localizing our... I mean, excuse me, they weren't deauthing. We were localizing our jamming attacks to this Using classroom. Using a focus beam to shoot it only at the Wi-Fi device that covers the classroom. <laughs> see that? See, be that. Be those hackers, kids. Be so good. Be so good that the jury just goes, were they really trying to cause damage? <laughs> right. <laughs> they just didn't want to take class. Yeah. Hopefully, that doesn't ruin their lives, honestly, because, I mean, they're young. They made some mistakes. Uh, yeah. They'll be okay. Um, related to Wi-Fi. Dragon's Blood. Oh, boy. Analyzing WPA3, not 2, 3, the new uh, standard, Dragonfly Handshake. And I'll leave a link. I'm not going to go over every little detail. Mm -hmm. uh, but what essentially has happened, so the Wi-Fi Alliance is a group. So you have the IEEE group that is, uh, assembles standards, but the Wi-Fi Alliance is a little different. They are a pay-to-play and they develop it behind closed doors because us, us other outside whoa, hacking people. Whoa, hold on, wait. They're a what now? Yeah. Right. They're a private organization that develops Wi-Fi and develops a standard behind closed doors because they don't want us smart people on the outside interfering with the smart people on the inside. Hmm. And when they're done, they do publish this, which led to someone going, wow, you implemented it wrong. But... By the time you find out they implemented it wrong, they've also gave it to the vendors. They sent it out as a ratified standard of, all right, go make these Wi-Fi chips to support mm -hmm. WP3 and these methodologies, and they have a flaw that was discovered in the handshake. Now, these security researchers aren't your average. Matter of fact, I don't know why these aren't the people and even right. kind of, they make a kind of snarky comment on uh, in here that I could like for if this wasn't designed through security through obscurity, these are the same people that found in the crack attack that happened last year that caused a lot of updates to the WP2 protocol, which of course didn't happen uh, because most old stuff never gets updated. Yes, if you're running commercial or if you're paying me to supply your Wi-Fi, I updated, right. but <laughs> and I maintain my client's <laughs> equipment. But we know most people go, there was an attack last year. I haven't updated my Wi-Fi in five years. Yeah, probably you're right. <laughs> so. It probably exists in there. Um, so same people who did this research, they applied some really interesting algorithms to WP3, and the, it's referred to as a Dragonfly handshake. They have a very, very technical debrief, and that's why I said it, you, I could make an entire episode. Maybe I will do a deep dive walking through their security research. But it's a 16-page detailed write-up of how they're able to leak information but not exactly crack it. So there's two-pronged two attack what they have here. First, deauthing. Mm -hmm. WP3 was designed to avoid situations like the crack attack mm -hmm. because uh, WP3 uh, is last year was ratified. WPA2 was ratified, I think, like 10 mm -hmm. years ago, right. maybe uh, longer. A little bit longer. 
Yeah, so it's been around for a long time, and, you know, security protocols have gotten better. But what they found was they just implemented a couple things out of order mm -hmm. in their security handshake, and that's where these guys found that edge to get in. Now, they also, this is my favorite part when hackers are smart asses, <laughs> they found out that they could do a denial of service on a commercial WPA3 device with a Raspberry Pi, and they commented it doesn't even get above 27% CPU usage to shut down commercial Wi-Fi. The attack that it was literally supposed to mitigate is possible. Now, through that edge attack, they're able to acquire encrypted credentials, mm -hmm. and then they would have to use, and they talk about the compute time needed of a, depending on how much entropy was used in the password. So it's not like it's just drop and password. It's not. It's a non-arbitrary attack, by the way. It also is fairly complicated, but it's documented. It now has CVEs and cert IDs assigned to it and the trickier part is if this would have been engineered with the thoughts that these people are putting into from the beginning one it wouldn't have happened two they're trying to do a workaround on the engineering of a ratified standard versus if they would have done the standard differently now this is it, developing things behind closed doors in a security market you know you know we're going to poke at it security <laughs> people are going to poke at it Geniuses like these these two are going to find a hole in it. Yep. This is why there is no security through obscurity. All standards, if you have to have obscurity in the way you're developing a security standard, it's probably not secure. Nope. You're you hiding can, something. You're hiding something. Yep. You're afraid. You're, you, you don't want someone to check your math problem and make sure it equates properly here. <laughs> I like, <laughs> like that. This is why your teacher always says, show your work. I like that. <laughs> this is to show your work. You can't just say it's secure. Right. You need to prove it. And public code audits do that, but when you develop it and then say, hey, this is the gold standard we came up with, you took it away from public eye. So I'm really not happy with the way the Wi-Fi Alliance does this, and you know, hopefully this is a lesson learned. Maybe they'll change their ways. Maybe they'll look for, okay, you're right. WP4 <laughs> will have a different flaw in yep. it that these same people I have faith in. Well, in another 10 years, we'll have WP4, and uh, these guys will drop another. Yep, or, uh, or it'll be me. <laughs> or maybe him. Yeah, they may they may retire, but someone will pick the torch up and oh, find sure. this and Definitely. find the security hole sure. in the way that works. It'll probably be those kids who are just jamming Wi Fi in high school. <laughs> Right. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're jamming Wi High School now. By the time WP4 comes out, they'll be uh, cracking WP4 and going, yeah. you guys could have been playing this better if you would have asked us. Like, hey. And they can see that. Look, we were jamming Wi-Fi back when it was in high school. See? See? 20 years into our careers, we're, like, really good at this now. All right, there exactly. you go. Stick out of kids. Stick out of kids, yeah. Nothing – see, there is no security through obscurity. That nope. just doesn't work. Nope. Um, the next one is – this is a report, and it's kind of not a paywall, but it's a one of those you got to sign up probably from. Give them a bogus email address so you can get the full detailed report. But I'll read the highlights of the report: the vulnerability epidemic in financial services and mobile apps. And you know, everyone wants it. I, I need my phone to do my banking and all that. Actually, I don't. I don't do any banking on my phone. It's, there's a reason I don't do banking on my phone because I don't trust the apps. I don't feel like to reverse engineering them. I have this weird feeling. Without reading the rest of this report, what do you think? Lowest bidder, um, newest guy they could find out of high school, probably developed the app. What do you think? What are the um, odds? I think it's probably like Xamarin or something, some bad framework or what Cordova. Apache Cordova or something that Ooh. is in supposed to go to every single phone. Or oh yeah, yeah. Titanium. I, Xamarin's not bad if you do it properly, but <laughs> oh. then they make Xamarin. Ah, come on, Miguel is an awesome dude. So, there you anyways, go. All right. I like Miguel. He can come up with gnome at least. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave it alone. Well, that's right. a whole different. Topic. It's a whole different topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, this is the, the and they did not name specific apps. They didn't have to. They simply took all the major banking apps. So, mm -hmm. wink and a nod, you can figure out who the major banking apps American are. American Express, yeah. Chase, <laughs> yeah. And World's a lack of binary protection they found on ninety seven percent of them. <laughs> yeah. So I actually kinda of wish they would have done an inverted list, but they just told the this one passed. <laughs> and kind of that's how You know what's interesting? Uh, maybe this is a, this is this may be an industry problem. Mm -hmm. This may be an industry problem. Um, maybe because and, and this is speculation here on my end, I, I used to I used to dabble in, you know, apps. Um, you, know, you have to pass your package along to Apple. I don't know if people realize that, well, but like you have to basically say, here's my package, go through it to make sure it doesn't do malicious things. And so if you're packing it right, right with a cryptor, quote unquote, so that it is obfuscated, mm -hmm. then that auditor doesn't really get to see. No. No? No. All right. No, they, because the way they text, the way they test the sandbox is yeah. uh, Signal does it in a secure way. Yeah. Mm. So does uh, um, whoop, so does what's the other one? Uh, Keybase. Both of them pass the security tape. So you, you can use those. Anyway, I agree. No benefit of doubt for you guys. Nothing. Yeah. Well, you well, just can't lose. Even be nice. Can't you even lose. be nice. 
I mean, but well, we can't skip over the fact that most people are doing mobile banking on open Wi-Fi networks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's definitely other security concerns about mobile banking. So I'll read a couple that are unintended data leakage. 90% of the apps tested shared services with other applications, leaving data from the financial institutions app accessible to other applications. Now, this is a checkbox when you're mm-hmm. do, is a developer. Do you want to share with others? No. I want an isolated app mm-hmm. with does not have abilities to share. Matter of fact, even like Signal, um, when you're going through the app screen, it, you can have it turn off so it does not even display. If he sends me a message on Signal, it does not show up mm-hmm. as a notification yep. because you can say, don't share any information, forcing me to open the app and then you can go a step further and put a password on top of the app so Mm -hmm. they're not doing that weak encryption now this is where the encryption gets a little bit more detailed 80 percent of the apps tested implemented weak encryption algorithms or incorrect implementation of strong ciphers so the strong cipher was available they didn't use it they didn't it's like oh yeah i have this awesome encrypted system and i set that to be the password one as the password so when you don't properly implement strong encryption so yeah oh cool aes 256 cbc all the way but we forgot to add a longer key to it so or we use the same key all the way across all the devices yeah we're using admin (laughs) so yeah great it's encrypted admin though (laughs) <laughs> it's encrypted admin. It's encrypted admin. So, you know, they didn't, I just said, you don't have to know the details, but the, the strong ciphers were there. They're available to us. Um, AES-256 is common now. It's not hard to implement. Um, well, if you come up with your own way of implementing it, I guess Which it is. Which don't. Please don't. Yeah, don't please roll don't. your own crypto. Don't roll your own crypto. There you go. Trust the, the people who have vetted other crypto out there. Just use it. Work around current frameworks. Uh, unless you're a super genius and you're, Nope. It's not easy. It's not easy. I'm not saying you can't. I'm not saying no one can, but I'm if saying... If you're I, a super genius, you know why you just go to the vetted, yeah. the, the vetted solution. There's a reason. That, as the people get smarter, they go, oh, I guess I don't need to invent my own security stack. Mm-hmm. This AES stuff pretty works good. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, we now have... Uh, we can do Diffie-Hellman full key exchange. We can do elliptic curve encryption. Mm-hmm. We have some of the quantum proof stuff. It's out there. It's documented how to use it. Um, don't think you're smarter than the guys that did that. <laughs> right. I mean, maybe you are, but you better really be willing to test that. Or and that's not, it's that's going not to get se- tested. That's not security through obscurity at all. No, those dudes no. are like secure, uh, 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 security the, through math. How? Yeah. How? And how <laughs> the how those key exchanges are implemented is well documented. Mm-hmm. It's it's not a secret at all. Seventy percent of the apps use an insecure random number generator, a security measure that relies on random values to restrict sensitive resources, making the values guessed and hackable. R and D's. Yeah. Yes, not not getting good R and D. You need good random numbers. Random. Whatever they were doing, they weren't doing it right. Oh, so, boy. yeah, that's These the are like, this is like ninety one called, and we're like <laughs> having the same pro- a poor R and D, poor encryption. Yes. Like wh- what? No obfuscation on binaries. What? Like what is this? What is this? This is like the most highly attacked, mm-hmm. you know, um, sector of our world right now. It's finance. How dare you not put the extra security on it? Yeah. You already have all the money. You have it all. Even before I spend it, you get it. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, just. But is this a security issue or just. Yes, like, this is a security issue. Or is it a <laughs> rush from the developers <laughs> that, that, to hurry up and get it out without properly. Security is the very most and utmost primary concern. We know that. But do. The banks? I think so. <laughs> Because I could just put sideload this video game that's Candy Crush with a K <laughs> that can now see every single time you get a bank deposit and maybe be able to do something weird with that notification because you're sharing data. Yeah, and this is part of the problem. They stored it in some of the because when you're when you're a app developer, apps are developed a little differently. So each one uh, and this goes across Android and on Apple. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a series of randomization. So there's not a common place they store data. That's part of the obfuscation for every app. It's randomly generated. That's perfect. Then you have to go to the common areas on a phone so I can share data between yes. them, like your downloads folder and things like that. They only, it's a banking app. Why would I ever need information to come from any of those other or share with those other? And those are restrictions they just didn't check the box. Yeah, like why would I ever execute from the temp directory? Right. There's never. <laughs> yeah, or share never. any data into or out or of into the, the temp directory. Right. So there's just some, in, these are just some security things, and these are those edges you need to get into the system. So it's, it's a mess. It's a mess, mm-hmm. but to, we're gonna to say the least. we're gonna cover the next mess because this is fun. <laughs> mm. This is this is the debrief here. So welcome to Matrix. This is Matrix.org, an open 
network for secure decentralized communication. So I'm going to read a little bit about what Matrix is if you haven't heard of it. Uh, but Matrix is basically a decentralized mess messaging system. Ma Matrix is an open source fabric for communication that anyone can participate in. A good intro to Matrix is by joining the decentralized chat rooms like Matrix HQ. Now, if you've ever used, and a lot more people have heard of WeChat and uh, Riot. Mm -hmm. Those are pretty popular chat apps and they're built on Matrix. So it's an open source, uh, sent decentralized, but uh, ability to federate. And what it means, and it's a little bit complicated, same picture, like you think of a company like Facebook or anyone and they have a chat system or WhatsApp, but you can't host your own WhatsApp server. Mm -hmm. you, you use the WhatsApp client and you use the WhatsApp thing on the back end that they own. Well, Matrix is going, hey, you can run it against our servers, which are open, but you can also stand up your own server in your own hosting. And from there, you can centralize it so you can connect the chat rooms in this other central server. So it's a system that allows you some integration, but it kind of decentralizes. This is a cool concept. There's a couple companies like uh, Mastodon coming up with a Twitter replacement uh, that are decentralized instead of one company being in fully control. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a cool movement if you want to get into it. But... <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the security. What, what and if you down. want to get into it. <laughs> oh, and someone wanted to get real into it. <laughs> and they did. And they did. Ooh, Spoiler alert. They definitely Spoiler alert. Did. They definitely did. And uh, so this is where things go a little off the rails for them. Is Now, the attack was... Uh, they, how they got a foothold in there. Let me read the actual exposure. So it's, This is an interesting one, right? This is one of my favorite... Uh, kinds of attacks is something that yeah. I've talked to people over at Amazon about. It's something that you know when people when I like to talk to people who are just getting in, into security or are like you know in the, in that mid range in security. I always like to talk about the, the this particular kind of attack because it's something that as an entry level or as a mid level security person it, it bends your mind because you go okay how do I protect against this because yes. you're this is what you're up against. Yeah. So here is. The incident report, which is great. Matrix One, open source developers, open source company. So here's what you need to know. We're going to leave links to all this in the show notes here. Uh, an attacker gained access to servers hosting Matrix.org. The intruder had access to the production database, potentially giving them access to the unencrypted message data password hashes access token. As a precaution, if you... You're in a matrix.org user. You should change your password now. The matrix.org <laughs> home server has been rebuilt and running securely. Uh, bridges and other ancillary services, this blog, follow as soon as possible. And modular.im home servers have not been affected. Now, this is one of the things they want to make clear is separation. If you stood up a server yourself, your self-hosting matrix, you are not affected by this directly. And the reason why, it's not a flaw in the matrix protocol. This is completely a flaw in the developing team that was running this. This is the DevOps problem. This is when we're going to break down everything DevOps did wrong. <laughs> oh, and boy. thank you, thank you, because we didn't have to do much work on this. The oh, hacker, because he had control and took control of the GitHub and the packages, he had he pwned them top to bottom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then he went and posted on their own GitHub, here's what you all could have done better. And mm -hmm. I love that. I love what he did, and we're going to read through it because it's fun. And, and by the way, I must throw this out here. What he did is literally what I do. Yeah. I go and make issues and go, this is not this. You shouldn't do this. Like, fix this. Yeah. And it's so refreshing to see someone who is just an anonymous looks to be gray hat. Doesn't look to be 100% black hat because no. he didn't try and do anything no. malicious. And he no. actually told him what... Or she. Or she. Or she. Or she. Or she. We don't know who they are. <laughs> but they're, uh, they're, doing well, they're, doing some interesting, they're doing some interesting work on the weekends. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever they are. Yeah, so that's the whole matrix debrief of you know short answer what happened, but let's talk about the back end and how this person did it. We're mm -hmm. gonna we're gonna do the blow by blow because post there's there, we're gonna do the post mortem and this ah I just love that they took the time to write up everything that went wrong. So hackers love write ups. They love write ups, and this is this is that little dance on your grave. I pwned you. I'm on the end field. I'm tossing a football. I'm doing the dance. I'm like you know double fingers up here. <laughs> just I'm on the way out. I got everything I can. Uh, everything for. I can. I'm running mimi cats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he noticed their blog post that I read, and it's got a few more things in there. I'm not going to bore you with it because he didn't think it was extensive enough. So he starts with, I noticed your blog post that you were talking about doing a postmortem and steps you need to take. As someone who is intimately familiar with your entire infrastructure, I thought I could help you out. 
<laughs> Intimately. Oh, by the way, this has all been taken down, but we'll leave links to where I have acquired all this. Uh, we had to have a discussion so we could find this because once he hacked their GitHub and posted as them on GitHub, they decided to redo their GitHub and took all the stuff down. <laughs> but don't worry, we got copies of it all. We'll leave links for all of you down there so if you want to read through this. Let's face it, I'm not a sophisticated attacker. There was no crazy malware rootkits. It was SSH agent forwarding, authorized key two, because uh, he just he was able to keep the keys, and we'll get that in a second here, and through a, well, okay, Jenkins' oh, old zero day, <laughs> this, could, I know, this could have been detected by better monitoring of log files, alerting of anomalous behavior, compromised... And oh, compromise began well over a month ago. Considering deploying an elastic stack and collecting logs, certainly your for your production environment. So, first debrief here, no logs. He was he uh, gained access a couple months ago with a he said zero old day. So yes, it was a flaw in the Jenkins server that they, they did this is another piece of the DevOps framework they had in the back end that was not patched. So there's your edge, found it, popped it. And uh, zero old, yeah, not zero, a zero old, old. zero old day. We like to play on words. I love that <laughs> shirt coming soon. RedTeamClothing.com. Yeah. So here's another thing. The internal dash config repository contains sensitive data because he got in their GitHub mm -hmm. from this. So he acquired access, gets in their GitHub. Uh, the internal config con repository contains sensitive data, and the whole repository was often cloned onto hosts and then left there for long periods of time, even if most of the configs were not used on that host. Hosts should only have the configs necessary for them to function and nothing else. Kudos on using Passbolt. This could have gotten real messy otherwise. So, you know, they at least had a couple. He gave them kudos when they used a couple different things. I'm not, are you familiar with Passbolt? I'm no, not, I'm, not I'm not familiar. Yeah, me either. So I'm not really, I, I didn't take time to look that up to see what that was. But then it gets worse. This is this is where the bigger mistake was made. On each host, I tried to avoid writing directory to authorize keys because after a thorough peek at your matrix dash ansible private, I realized that access could have been removed by any time by an employee that added a new key or did something else to redeploy users. But SSHD config allowed me to keep keys authorized key two wow. and not have to worry about any ansible which, locking me out. Which authorized keys two? I'm pretty sure that's like. This continued, right? Well, no, no. What they did was, and this is interesting. So when you have authorized keys, so you have an SSH key pairing, so mm -hmm. we use public key authentication. That's good. That's strong. What Ansible does when I rebuild my servers, Ansible's going to look at the keys. Ansible's going to go get that server and go, oh, here's the key file. Let me pop it in there. What he was able to do was go, I'm going to wonder if I can add a second key. And he leaves a second key. So even if they redeploy the server mm -hmm. and redeploy the Ansible keys, it's allowing a second yeah. set of keys to be on there. It should only be implicitly allowing a single set of keys. Yeah. So what he did was he just copied it in there, added it to the config, to look in these, both these key files. One's mine, one's these other DevOps guys who aren't paying attention to me because they don't have an elastic sack. Yeah. They're, not, they're not looking. So he was able to do this. And what the concept is when Ansible deploys, it should be erasing the old keys, not allowing any other keys, and doing that. So this is that little comment on on how they did that. So it's just, these are, this is such a minor thing to do from a DevOps standpoint. If you're going to go through trouble and you know how to build an Ansible script, just tell it you can only use one key file. There's, it's not, this is not like a huge, like re-engineer your whole tool stack here. It's just don't allow another key file. But because they did, he just said, oh, I'll just put my keys in key two and allow it. There you mm -hmm. go. And when they overwrite the, because what they're doing to revoke access, and this this is actually a problem that would occur when you revoke access. Let's say each one of us has our own set of keys and Xavier doesn't want to work on the project no more. Mm -hmm. We redeploy the keys without Xavier's key. But what if Xavier popped a key file two on there? We shouldn't be allowing a key file two. It should only be a single key file on mm -hmm. per server. That's that's kind of a breakdown for that. I was able to log into servers via internet address. <laughs> this is where things get bad. This should no good reason to have your management ports exposed to the entire internet. Never. That is almost, I think, what he should have said in the very first line of this. Why would you have your management ports on SSH exposed? Consider restricting access to production, either a VPN or a Bastion host. So you, this is one of those things like, you don't want to open up SSH unless absolutely you have to. And especially when you do things like allow a separate key file, you allow a second key file, and you leave SSH open. I mean, this is one of those debriefs on there. Mm -hmm. Why was it open? Why aren't you all VPNing in? VPNing is not that hard. You know, even pivoting through a jump box with proxy chains. I did a video on how to use proxy chains to get into something. There's ways you can do this. You can do it over VPN. You can do it with a proxy chain. There's ways mm -hmm. you can help add layers of access uh we've recently started using i did that video on there and you've like zero tier yep i like zero tier and i like shuttle too uh, yeah shuttle 
There's so yeah, zero tier is bad, badass. I gotta throw out that. I mean, <laughs> he's you know, even talked to uh, one of the engineers there. Yeah, and, yeah. Like they're they know their product really well. Yeah. It's tight. It's they're it's really a good. persistent, secure access. It's actually one of those weird times when yes, there's some convenience, but there's actually some security put in, and it's a little bit different than VPN. I'm not gonna go and and I'll and I'll throw this out there, mm-hmm. right? Red team. Mm-hmm. This one that you guys know, red team always wins. That UDP hole punching yeah. going out, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's some it, powerful stuff. If you're inside a corporate environment, the bells don't go off, brother. I'll, yeah, I'll that was actually out interesting there. that uh, we'll just say Xavier tested a few places and it worked. It and works. the bells didn't go off and the, he the had bells access. Don't go off. Hey. So that's another side of Zero Tier that we just were impressed with. But yes. either way, if they were using something like Zero Tier, because Zero Tier is not opening any ports at all, there are mm-hmm. no ports open. So he's able to access Zero Tier at home and Zero Tier at other places he was at. Other places. And which is cool, but it's also no ports are open on either server. You can have a hundred percent locked firewall. Uh, with with the exception of Zero Tier, will have problems if there's certain amounts of egress filtering. It will have problems, but that's not that yeah. egress filtering is not where the who does the egress filtering. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> But egress filtering wasn't a problem. This is ingress filtering. Right. The fact that they actually had ingresses into their uh, DevOps network, that's where the problem is. That's the debrief mm-hmm. on this. That's really bad. D- don't do that. Um, this is going next. Sir. Once I, I like this. Once I was in the network, a copy of your wiki really helped me out, and I found that someone was forwarding uh, ports over to Flywheel. With Jenkins access, this allowed me to add my own key to the host. Add, once again, adding it and make myself at home. Thanks, Jenkins. Thanks, Jenkins. There appeared to be no legitimate reason for this port forward, especially since Jenkins itself was being used to establish communication between uh, Themis and Flywheel. I'm not too familiar with the two different uh, products you're talking about right here. Jenkins, yes, but not the other ones. Mm-hmm. But either way, once again, they had an internal documentation server because you assume you don't have to lock down your internal documentation server. And yes, someone's going to point out, hey, Tom, don't you have a wiki? Yes, I do. How is it locked down? Very, very extremely, like even VPN internally to get over to the network and two-factor authentication Mm -hmm. with only SSH and filtered firewalls and ACL rules. So yeah, even if you were in my network, I always assume someone is in my network. So you take the time to lock down your documentation and how your network works (laughs) because you need to have all that. So yeah. And when you want it tested, give me a call. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and you do. We, he's tells, he pokes at stuff. You know, I want to know if I don't just think I'm smart and secure things. Well, I, the thing is, I'll just send an email to one of your guys and be like, "Free pizza." Yeah. And they'll uh, be like, "Oh shit, free pizza." <laughs> <laughs> Red team wins. Now, principle of least privilege. Mm. P-lop. P-lop. Oh P-lop. P-lop all day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is just learn this. Beat this in your head. Escalation could have been avoided if developers only had access they absolutely required, did not have access to all the servers. I would like to take a moment to think whichever developer forwarded their agent to Flywheel, without you, none of this would have been possible. <laughs> That's some real smart-ass stuff there, but I enjoyed it. But this is, this is uh, we had a conversation with a company, maybe one of the DC3 and 3 events, that kind of said... Hypothetically, and we're like looking at him, going, "Look, we know where you work." <laughs> but hypothetically, what if you had a dev team with uh, root access, pretty much every server on there, and your company grew really fast, and now they're trying to figure out how to pull it back, but they want to keep the devs happy? And we're like, "Pull it back, pull but, it back." But don't the, make the devs happy. Get the, a DevOps team. Make yeah. everybody a DevOps engineer. Only hire full stack guys. Yeah, be smart. <clears throat> be smart. So it, this happens at companies, and it becomes a very awkward thing, and we've talked about this. Like, you have to pull it back. If you don't mm-hmm. want to end up being um, on this show. <laughs> yeah. or, if you or don't want us, to be episode number seven. If you don't want to be episode number seven, <laughs> pull it back. Not everyone should have root access on there. This is bad. So uh, the final one is the SSA forwarding. Complete compromise could have been avoided if developers were prohibited from using forward agent yes or not using dash A in our SSH commands. Mm. This flaw, the flaws with the user agent forwarding is documented. This is one of those things where you can forward through servers your agent keys. So it's referred to as SSH agent forwarding. Um, I have it turned off on mine. You only turn it on like an as needed basis if there's a reason to use it. But once what this does is allow that SSH key to be passed uh, from one agent to another. So once you had mm-hmm. access to one, you're able just to ge- go laterally through all the servers. All right. um, I do like on the archived one that the first post is someone eating popcorn because, you know, <laughs> these are the comments on this because this was posted on their GitHub before they got control of their GitHub and taken down because they had keys, they had the signing certs for the matrix and everything else. They had else, the so. signing certs. Do you know how much... Carnage could have gone down with the signing was, search ooh. to the package. Yeah. This person, like they pwned them top to bottom, wrote it up, 
told them what they could have done better and left it alone. So this could have been much worse. They could have sat there. They could have developed threats inside of it. Mm -hmm. They could have poked and put things in there, which because this is the nice thing about being an open source development, if someone were to start inserting code in there. You wouldn't know. You, someone would have noticed. Someone would have said, what is this doing? But how? But then once that happens, you start having to figure out, because he had access to several DevOps people, you'd have to figure out who he was impersonating because he would be doing <laughs> it as an impersonation. Like, hey, yeah. why would you write this weird code over here that contacts this server in China? I mean, someone would have found it, but now it's already been deployed and compiled at that point, so now you have to issue a different it thing. This doesn't sound like it ever got to deployment. It never got that because this person just wanted to prove they could. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And do a debrief and do a write-up. I mean, this is some great write-up. This is some great yeah. insights. Uh, this is the ultimate egg on your face that you got pwned. <laughs> but uh, you got pwned by the right person. Yep. So that much is true. The debrief is good. Um, there's some security lessons learned. I bet I bet all this has been changed. And mm-hmm. I'm willing yeah. to bet we're going to see an update from the folks at Matrix. Say, Remember that guy's <laughs> write-up? It actually is pretty good. We, we suddenly have PLOP. <laughs> I would like that. I think that from my perspective, when I, when I think about this, you think about the origin of how this guy actually got this foothold immediately. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I was what I was getting at at the beginning. Um, from from what we know, from from the data that's out there, the, it, the compromise was not necessarily at the matrix level. It was right. at the hosting provider yeah. level. Mm-hmm. Well, so, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's at the very base level because it's all a DevOps problem. Right. You know, they got in through the the architecture, the DevOps Jenkins system that managed all this and just that got them in right to the code base because that's yes. where you're, that's where you don't just want at that back end, but it's that one little hole. And this exactly. is the thing that's happened with some of these other companies. So it's really. Yeah, uh, everything is not application security. No. Everything is not application security. Because the application yeah. secure. The matrix Op- protocol is solid. Exactly. Operational security slash operational excellence. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, network security is really, really important. Monitoring, alerting, um, lateral movement detection, uh, using deception, a.k.a. honeypots, right? Mm-hmm. We, like to, we like to say honeypots, but I like to call it deception just because I'm thinking about honeypots V2, right? So... Um, being able to have maybe uh, uh, something that you know for a fact your developers aren't supposed to touch, like another Jenkins box that yeah. <laughs> that have another set of signing keys. And the moment that uh, that attacker would have went to go touch that, that would have been a booby trap, yeah. and an alarm would have went off. And now I know that someone's moving laterally through my environment. Right. He was in their environment for over a month. For over yeah. a month. We over talked month. about that. And, and this is the same thing. This is where, where would you implement a honeypot in this? You would have had a, actually had that wiki had the outline of how their network was set up. You mm-hmm. would have had that in there. Oh, yeah. Uh, all Every night, everything's moved over to Production 2 server exactly. uh, over here. Wink and a nod. Verbally, you've made some agreement. Hey, no Production 2 server, if anyone touches it, you're fired because <laughs> you're the guy. This is our trip. This is our tripwire uh, into the systems that we know someone got in. So you document it as if it's part of your infrastructure. So someone reading your documentation like this guy, that's... These are all different ways you can use that to, to do this. But I think there's a lot of lessons learned here. It's a great debrief. We'll leave links to all this so you can read through it yourself mm-hmm. and grab the popcorn and sit back. Um, I mean, Matrix, like I said, a cool project. It's not really the fault of any – there's just the developers and the DevOps or maybe some of the same people. I don't know exactly who's in charge of each section of this because it's an open source project. But it's still a really interesting write-up, and it's something you can apply to your infrastructure because mm-hmm. um, you're trying to work on keeping your security team clean. But, hey, your DevOps team has to be – keeping all this locked down as well and everything up to date. Yeah, it's really up to them uh, when you really think about it. At the end of the day, it, it really does come down to DevOps to keep the infrastructure and operational excellence intact. They are the last quality gate. Um, I am a security engineer, right, for, mm-hmm. for a fun company that you guys could probably guess where I work. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I'm a security engineer on the DevOps team. Uh, you know, I mean, we are the la- safe. we are the last quality gate. I wouldn't say I could keep them safe. Oh. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> he tries. He's like having them bumpers. I make, like I make them, them the- aware, right? I put up guardrails, and that's right. a part of it, right? He, yeah. He called them bumpers, but what I call them are guardrails, and mm-hmm. you make sure that your your users can't do more than this, and they can't do more than that. And you know, I have users that go directly at the guardrails. So, um, but they learn and they start to flow with traffic, and that's kind of. Uh, the way that, you know, we, we talked about PLOP and principle of least, uh, you know, privilege. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that, that kind of is a part of the guardrails. This user can't make other users. This user can't edit roles. This user can't edit groups. Mm-hmm. You get what I mean? Yeah. This user can't do everything to every resource or is what we like to call star dot star <laughs> in the identity access yeah. management world. Shmod um, 777, man, yeah. that solves all the problems. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you never need that. No, well... <laughs> you could get it done with four seven sevens. All right, yeah. 
And more videos coming on that. There you go. And more videos coming on Zero Tier because uh, this guy's poked at it too. It's, it's pretty nice. And it's super easy. And it looks like I get a hundred, up to 100 devices yep. on unlimited networks. Yeah. Nice. Which is yeah, interesting for what I do for a living. So I, I, I it's like gonna this. Be, it's going to be places. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> I, I, we're, we're also talking about um, internally. I, mean, I didn't include you guys in this, but we said because you can create a public Zero Tier where everyone yeah. can join. We thought about creating our own little net of stuff to play with mm. where other people can join in the fun. If you do that. Just make sure that all of our subscribers, and you have to subscribe, click the subscribe button. All of our subscribers <laughs> should be able to get some access in some shape or fashion. That's all yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, I think that might be kind of fun because we could actually set up that and play a game of it. There you go. Yeah. I was thinking about some fun ways to do it because then people could just join the network on there. And it doesn't pose me as much of a risk when I do it because the way Zero Tier works, it does not have a gateway to give you outbound access. You right. only get internal access because it's a private network. Mm-hmm. Because if I were to let you VPN, then you could do something. Thing like go to some website that would get me in trouble Dude, and that's it, using my IP address and that's why I don't do that but doing it with zero tier could be fun because I can set up a little private repository and like a treasure hunting game there you go capture the flag yeah that'd be fun yeah I think that's fun me and fine yeah. might do it anyways that's enough maybe today. we'll put some honey pots on there and see put some honey bots can... see what people can find yeah. Yeah. <laughs> see if they can trip the wire see if you can't trip the wire Right now, he's been busy working on cracking servers and gaining root. For... Uh huh. The OSCP. Um, I'm in the PWK lab. I'm not ashamed. This is my third time, right? First time I went for 90 days. Second time I went for 60. This time I'm going for 30. This time I'm going at it with a completely different mindset, mind frame. So um, if I fail, I fail. But uh, I learned so much from this go round legally <laughs> that it doesn't even have to be alleged. It's right. actual legally. So, actual legally. Um, I'm just enjoying myself. And yeah. I'm staying up way too late and drinking way too much caffeine. So hopefully I survive the next yes. 15 days. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go reduce that access. Close them firewall holes. Uh, think of better ways to do it and see you in the next episode. Oh, and um, oh. upgrade Windows XP Service Pack 1 because oh, yeah, they, yeah, have, yeah, some, they yeah. have some nasty <laughs> <laughs> vulnerabilities you might want to check out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quit quit these old machines. Come on, man, turn them off. You know that's actually the challenge we have is trying to figure out which stories to cover because there's like it's too much. There's too much all the time, and so much of it's stupid stuff. Listen to yeah. Darknet Diaries. We've mentioned it like yeah. no joke. I love it. The the one they just released on the uh, banking stuff, and a lot of it's some face palming. Like oh yeah, they had an older version. Uh, they found an old not patched Windows box, and then they didn't expect them to be inside the network. And yeah. Great, the, the, the whole ATM hacking one. The couple recent posts by Darknet Diaries. Listen to that. It's it's inspirational. It's I, intense. I, I want to get to that level of production so that, too, that guy is good. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Jack, Jack Reisider? Jack Reisider. There He's, you go. Oh, yeah. Inspiration. Inspiration, man. And right. Hack 5 and all those other people. Give them a shout out. Oh, yeah. Oh, Dear Kitchen. The, Dear oh, yeah, Kitchen. For sure. Follow, yeah. Mubix and, uh, and his blog and uh, mm-hmm. yeah. everything. everything. So yeah, much. we we don't we we, we know someone because someone made a comment to me like oh you're copying dark no no we're not copying dark. Oh, we're, we're not sharing copying. like we're all there's plenty of security to cover oh, we yes. love all those people oh, sure. give them a shout yes. out listen to them too oh, yeah. hell I'll say they they've been doing a great job on it so we're out man later right. later. <laughs>